Margaret Sanger, the founder of Planned Parenthood, said the following, the most merciful thing that a large family does to one of its infant members is to kill it. Planned Parenthood is not ashamed of what they have done or continue to do, but we will have to give an account as a nation before God for our apathy and for the murder of over 50 million children in the womb. Ms. Smith, in the precursor to the Gonzalez case, the case of Stenberg versus Carhartt, Justice Kennedy dissented from the decision to strike down the partial birth abortion ban, which was later upheld by, in the Gonzalez case in a, a different ban. A different version, yeah. That's right. He described at length the testimony provided by abortionist Leroy Carhartt about the alternate DNA method or dismemberment procedure. The fetus can be alive at the beginning of the dismemberment process and can survive for a time while its limbs are being torn off. Dr. Carhart agreed that when you pull out a piece of the fetus, let's say an arm or a leg, and remove that, at the time just prior to removal of the portion of the fetus, the fetus is alive. Dr. Carhart also has observed fetal heartbeat via ultrasound with extensive parts of the fetus removed and testified that mere dismemberment of a limb does not always cause death because he knows a physician who removed the arm of a fetus only to have the fetus go on to be born as a living child with one arm. At the conclusion of a d &E abortion, no intact fetus remains. In Dr. Carhart's words, the abortionist is left with a tray full of pieces. Justice Kennedy said, the fetus in many cases dies just as a human adult or child would. It bleeds to death as it is torn from limb from limb. Ms. Smith, do you believe this practice represents a humane way to die? Let me separate, which I think is something that's getting confused here in this hearing uh, again and again, which is procedures performed on pre-viable fetuses and procedures that are formed on viable fetuses. Uh, both of the women here on this panel are here today because they were viable at the time the procedures were performed. What you're talking about is pre-viability uh, procedures performed on a fetus that cannot survive outside. Maybe, maybe body. not. Justice Kennedy was talking about a child that was born alive with only one arm because the other had been pulled off already in the abortion procedure. That's My right. question but to you is, are you going to answer it, is this a humane way to die? I believe for a fetus, a uh, pre-viable fetus, yes, a DNA procedure is a very humane procedure and it protects the woman uh, and her health and safety uh, more than any other procedure. And in fact, it was Ms. substituted Ms. Smith, for the I'm going to reclaim my time procedure. and just say that yeah. I have to say that your view of humanity and mine are different. There are people who have real concerns, moral concerns about abortion that aren't rooted in their desire to oppress women. That, th these are sure. real questions, and when you spew mindless propaganda about choice and medical procedures and blah, 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 it kind of blurs what is a really important question, like, do you have the right to take a life? Do you see that at all? Mm. I think what you're confusing is the, the question of who has the right to make decisions about their own lives. So you're and, saying uh, it's what, okay, So, but you concede that it's the taking of a life at that stage. If the child can live outside the womb, that's, that's killing. Would you just concede that, or are you going to pretend it's not? Uh, once the baby is outside of a womb, then you have rights. You're an individual. Until that happens, you can't okay. exist without being out of the womb. Tucker recently spoke to former abortion clinic worker Abby Johnson about what really goes on inside the walls of Planned Parenthood. How long did you work at Planned Parenthood? I was there for eight years. And what did you do while you were there? I was the clinic manager, so I took care of just the day-to-day -day operations, hiring and firing personnel, making sure that um, our that our budgets were maintained, including uh, our abortion quota uh, that we had to maintain every month. Um, so that and was pretty excuse much me, my by, job. By that, you mean you had to perform a certain number of abortions in that clinic every month? 
That's right. So every abortion facility within Planned Parenthood has a monthly abortion quota that they must meet. Why? That's how they make their money. Uh, about 50% of their income is just cash from abortion services. And so in order to keep their clinics open, they have to sell so many abortions. But what about all the mammograms and life-saving work they do? <laughs> Yeah, you know, funny about mammograms, uh, there's not a Planned Parenthood in the country that provides mammogram services. Um, they don't provide prenatal care. They, they don't do a lot of the things that they say that they do. So basically it's an abortion clinic. Pretty much, yeah. They provide a few things, um, STD testing and, and birth control, but they provide birth control because according to their own numbers, 54% of women who have abortions were using birth control at the time that they got pregnant. So they know that that's just a way to get these young girls, especially, I mean, I'm 37 years old. I couldn't remember to take a pill at the same time every day. So, you know, get these young girls in there, uh, put them on a, a, a pill with a, or a method with a high human error rate, and eventually they're going to end up pregnant and that's another way to sell them an abortion so they also sell fetal tissue baby parts and you saw that happen what are the economics right. of that yeah um, at the affiliate where I worked we sold we sold the whole body for about two hundred dollars per fetus um, that went to a company called Amphioxus. And, uh, you know, the Houston facility, the, the largest, I, I worked for that affiliate. Uh, it's the largest abortion facility in the Western Hemisphere, second largest to China. And, um, we were doing, we had capacity to perform about 75 abortions every day, six days a week. So if you look at even, you know, even half of those uh, women, you know, having tissue that, that is suitable to be donated, uh, donated uh, or sold, then, you know, you're looking at over $2 million a year um, just at that one clinic. But I, I thought that Planned Parenthood or any facility like Planned Parenthood is not allowed to sell human parts. Yeah, it's interesting because the way that they that they line item everything, um, it looks like it's a legitimate business transaction. Um, but if you because the the law says that they can charge for things like shipping and handling and right. uh, you know things like that. And so if they line item it correctly, then it looks like that you're just paying for handling services or for shipping services. Um, but really, there is no additional handling involved. There is no additional shipping involved. Amphioxus came and picked up the parts from our facility. But if you line item it correctly, then that's how they're skirting around the law. So in your eight years there, did any of your coworkers ever acknowledge how ghoulish and horrible the whole thing is? Just the, the whole enterprise that you were in the middle of? Yeah, I mean, I think, though, what happens is, and this happened to me as well, I mean, when you're working inside of an industry like that, um, you become very dark and um, you stop seeing just the heinous acts that you're participating in and it becomes a joke. And I remember my supervisor, you know, joking about uh, the babies that we aborted and uh, things, you know, like our the security code on our alarm uh, was 2229 because that spelled out baby and they thought that was just hilarious. Um, the freezer and in the lab where we pieced together baby parts uh, and we, we would after we reassembled them we would put them in this freezer uh, everybody jokingly called that the nursery so you you begin to have this very dark humor and even though I mean you have to at some point recognize what we're doing is is really heinous and really gruesome um, you sort of build up this callus looking back how do you how do you feel about it all that you worked there? Well, I mean, I, I'm certainly sorry that I participated in, in something like that, but I feel like I've really been given an opportunity now to speak out about the experiences I had and, and uh, turn the evil that I participated in into something good. And so that's what I'm trying to do. Well, we're grateful that you came. I mean, this is a subject cloaked by euphemisms, and it's just nice to know what choice really means. Thanks for telling us, Abby. Thank you so much.
tell my parents that I was pregnant and my boyfriend didn't want a baby. So I made my appointment with Planned Parenthood. I was so scared when I arrived, I paid my money and I sat in the waiting room. I was then taken back to a room with a nurse and asked how I felt about this. I told her, this had to be wrong, it had to be a baby. She told me it was just a blob of tissue, that this abortion would be easier and safer than if I carried it to term. Yes. <laughs> Good morning. My name is Gianna Jessen and I would like to thank you so much for the opportunity to testify here today. My biological mother was seven and a half months pregnant when she went to a Planned Parenthood and was advised, and they advised her to have a late term saline abortion. This method of abortion burns the baby inside and out, blinding and suffocating the child, who is then born dead, usually within 24 hours, and there should be a photo <laughs> there. Yes, this is what I survived. Instead of dying, after 18 hours of being burned in my mother's womb, I was delivered alive in an abortion clinic in Los Angeles on April the 6th, 1977. You can see a photo as well of my medical records. Um, my medical records state, born alive during saline abortion, 6 a.m. Ha! <laughs> Victory! Thankfully, the abortionist was not at work yet. Had he been there, he would have ended my life with strangulation, suffocation, or leaving me there to die. Instead, a nurse called an ambulance. Ryan Little. <laughs> and I was rushed to a hospital. Doctors did not expect me to live. I did. I was later diagnosed with cerebral palsy, which was caused by a lack of oxygen to my brain while surviving an abortion. I was never supposed to hold up my head or walk, I do. And cerebral palsy, ladies and gentlemen, is a tremendous gift to me. I was eventually placed in foster care and later adopted. And hear me clearly, I forgive my biological mother. Within the first year after my birth, I was used as, as an expert witness in a case where an abortionist had been caught strangling a child to death after being born alive. I laid on the table and I waited for the doctor that I had never met before, which is most times the case. To come in, this doctor was cold and he was unfriendly. He told me to lie still, that it wouldn't take long. I had no anesthetic for the pain. He said that I would just feel tugging and a slight sensation and cramping. That was not true. It was the most extremely painful procedure I've ever had done. I could hear the increased labor and every time the suction machine would pull a part or a limb of my baby from my body. Each time I kept trying to sit up to see what was going into that jar. Was it my baby? They kept pushing me back down and telling me to lie still. As soon as the procedure was over, they quickly wheeled the jar out of the room with my baby's remains. They knew it was my baby. They saw the head, they saw the feet, they saw the arms. I wasn't told about fetal development when I was at Planned Parenthood. <clears throat> they didn't tell me that my unborn baby that they were ripping out of my body would have arms, had legs, had a heartbeat, fingerprints, and she could feel pain. Why didn't they want to tell me that? Were they afraid that I would change my mind? It must have been a wrong choice if after knowing all the facts, I chose life for my child. On the way home, I was in severe pain. I laid in the back seat crying and bleeding profusely. And when I got home, I called Planned Parenthood and I told them about the pain and the bleeding. They told me that this was no longer their problem, that I would need to call my own physician. There was no way I was going to call my own physician. I was too scared, I was too ashamed, and I didn't want my parents to find out what I had done. So I painfully laid there that day and wondered if I would die. The happy, fun-loving Luana did die that day along with my baby. I became depressed, angry. I started drinking heavily. I started doing drugs and I became very pr Every time we falter, encourage as individuals and fail to confront this evil, I wonder, how many lives have been lost in our silence 
while we make sure we are lauded among men. And that we don't offend anyone. How many children have died and been dismembered and their parts sold for our ego, our convenience, and our promiscuity? How many Lamborghinis were purchased with the blood of innocent children? The blood that cries to the Lord from the ground, like that of the blood of Abel. Not one of them, ladies and gentlemen, is forgotten by him. I would ask Planned Parenthood the following questions 38 years later. I would ask them these questions. If abortion is about women's rights, then what were mine? You continuously use the argument, if the baby is disabled, we need to terminate the pregnancy, as if you can determine the quality of someone's life. Is my life less valuable due to my cerebral palsy? You have failed in your arrogance and greed to see one thing. It is often from the weakest among us that we learn wisdom. Something sorely lacking in our nation today, and it is both our folly and our shame that blinds us to the beauty of adversity. Planned Parenthood uses deception, the manipulation of language, and slogans such as a woman's right to choose to achieve their monetary aims. I will illustrate how well they employ this technique with the following quote. The receptivity of the masses is very limited. Their intelligence is small, that the, but their power of forgetting is enormous. In consequence of these facts, all effective propaganda must be limited to a very few points and must harp on these in slogans until the last member of the public understands what you want him to understand by your slogan, Adolf Hitler. We often hear that if Planned Parenthood were def defunded, were to be defunded, there would be a health crisis among women without the services they provide. This is absolutely false. Pregnancy resource centers are located nationwide as an option for the woman in crisis. All of their services are free and confidential. They can be reached by texting HELPLINE to 313131. There is access to vital exams for women other than Planned Parenthood. We are not a nation without options. Planned Parenthood receives $500 million of taxpayer money a year to primarily destroy and dismember babies. Do not tell me these are not children. A heartbeat proves that. So does 40 ultrasounds, so do I. And so does the fact that they are selling human organs for profit. Do not tell me this is only a woman's issue. It takes both a man and a woman to create a child. And to that point, I wish to speak to the men listening to me. You are made for greatness. You were born to defend women and children, not to use and abandon us, nor sit idly by while you know we are being harmed, and I am asking you to be brave. In conclusion, let me say, I am alive because of the power of Jesus Christ alone, in, in whom I live, move, and have my being. Without him, I would have nothing, and with him, I have all. Thank you. This is the number of abortions that Planned Parenthood's 2014 fiscal report lists as being completed that year. Based on these numbers, 897 children will lose their lives to an abortion completed by Planned Parenthood each and every day. Why do I find this horrific? Because I actually have a lot in common with them. I was meant to be one of them. I should have been just another statistic. But by the grace of God, I am more than a statistic. I come here to you today as a wife, a mother, a daughter, a sister, a master's level prepared social worker, and yes, as an abortion survivor. From a botched abortion to the dreaded complication, a child who lives, I've been called just about everything that you can imagine.
But if you want to turn your attention up to the screen, as you can see in my medical records from 1977, kind of right there in the middle, saline infusion for an abortion was done, but was unsuccessful. And in other times throughout my medical records, you will read statements like, the complication of my birth mother's pregnancy was a saline infusion abortion. You could certainly say that saline infusion complicated the pregnancy. It has taken years to unravel the secrets surrounding my survival, to have contact with my biological family, and even medical professionals that cared for me. And although there are still unanswered questions, what I do know is that my life was intended to be ended by that abortion. And even after I survived, my life was in jeopardy. You wouldn't know it by looking at me today, but in August of 1977, I also survived a saline infusion abortion. And as Gianna shared, that saline infusion abortion involves injecting a toxic salt solution into the amniotic fluid surrounding the preborn child. The intent of that toxic salt solution is to scald the child to death from the outside in. For days, I soaked in that toxic salt solution, and on the fifth day of the procedure, my biological mother, who was a 19-year-old college student, delivered me after her labor was induced. I should have been delivered dead that day as a successful abortion. In 2013, I learned through contact with my biological mother's family that not only was this abortion forced upon her against her will at the age of 19, but also that it was my grandmother, my maternal grandmother, a nurse, who delivered me in this final step of the abortion procedure at St. Luke's Hospital in Sioux City, Iowa. Unfortunately, I also learned that when my grandmother realized that the abortion had not succeeded in ending my life, she demanded that I be left to die. I may never know how exactly two nurses who were on staff that day found out about me, but what I do know is that their willingness to fight for medical care to be provided to me ultimately sustained my life. And I know where children like me were left to die at St. Luke's Hospital. I met a nurse there who delivered a child much like me in 1976. She delivered a little boy after a failed saline infusion abortion. But she followed her superior's orders, and she placed him there in a utility closet in a bucket of formaldehyde to be picked up later as medical waste after he was left there to die alone. A bucket of formaldehyde in a utility closet was meant to be my fate after I survived that abortion attempt. I weighed a little less than three pounds when I survived. I suffered from jaundice, severe respiratory problems, and seizures for an extended period of time. And one of the first notations in my medical records by a doctor after I survived is that I looked like I was about 31 weeks gestational age when I was delivered. Despite the miracle of my survival, the doctor's prognosis for my life was very poor initially. My adoptive parents were told that I would suffer from multiple dis disabilities throughout my life. Yet here I am today, perfectly healthy. Yet I know it isn't just how abortion ends the life of children like me that isn't talked about in today's world. It's also not discussed what happens to children like me who live. I can tell you we are your friend, your neighbor, your coworker, and you would likely never guess by passing us on the street that we survived what we did. In my work as the founder of the Abortion Survivors Network, I have had contact with 203 of these other survivors. Letters from some of those survivors have been submitted to this committee. I'm here today to share my story to not only highlight the horror of abortion taking place at Planned Parenthood, but to give a voice to other survivors like me, and most importantly, to give a name, a face, and a voice to the hundreds of thousands of children who will have their lives ended by Planned Parenthood this year alone. As you consider the horror of what happens at Planned Parenthood each day, I would urge you to remember my story and Gianna's too. We may not have survived abortions at Planned Parenthood, but the expectation for our lives to be ended by abortion are the very same as those who do lose their lives there. And I have long believed that if my birth mother's abortion would have taken place at a Planned Parenthood, I would not be here today. Completing over 300,000 abortions a year provides them with the experience to make sure that failures like me don't exist. 
as a fellow American and as a fellow human being, I deserve the same right to life, the same equal protection under the law as each and every one of you. Yet we live in a time where not only do such protections not exist, but my own tax dollars and yours go to fund an organization that has perfected the very thing that was meant to end my life. And this must end. And chose abortion both times. Each experience was similar to the first, except for the second abortion, they showed me blobs of tissue on slides and told me that that's all that they would be removing, not a baby. By the third abortion, I was so ashamed and embarrassed, embarrassed, I didn't even give them my real name. I gave them a friend of mine's name. I cringed to think what would have happened if there would have been complications or I died on the table that day. Who would they have called? Would my parents have ever found out? Having an abortion didn't solve any of my problems. It only created new ones and larger ones. The way I dealt with them was more alcohol, more drugs, anything to numb the pain. And I even tried to kill myself. But God had a plan for my life. I found hope and forgiveness in Jesus and I accepted him as my Lord and my life began to change. I met a wonderful man and we were married and we wanted to start a family, but we were having no success. I went for endless tests, and one of the tests that I had done was a dye test to determine if there was blockages in my fallopian tubes. During the test, my doctor asked if I had ever had abortions, and I admitted that I had three. She showed me on the screen where my tubes were damaged and mangled from the abortion procedure. She said I would never have children because of the abortion, and she wanted me to have a hysterectomy so that I would not have an ectopic pregnancy. She left the room, and I laid there paralyzed and let it soak in that the only children I would ever bear, I had killed. I had to tell my husband that he was never going to be able to have his own children because of the choices I had made. I wondered if he would want a divorce. We had a hard road of tears and sleepless nights and counseling sessions. I learned to forgive myself and the abortion workers for not telling me the risks and the possibilities of infertility. I was angry that I was lied to and that I didn't get all the facts so that I could make the choice for myself. I thought they were pro-choice and cared for women. I didn't feel cared for. I felt used and I felt abused. I live with the consequences and the pain and the regret of abortion every day, along with many other women. In front of me are pages of sworn testimonies of women who have been hurt and abused physically, emotionally, psychologically by Planned Parenthood and other abortion industry in general. I'm here representing them as well as myself, and it is a heavy load. I'm asking you to please consider these stories and mine when you make legislation and when you make decisions about defunding Planned Parenthood and about abortion. All of us who have been hurt by abortion are being made to pay Planned Parenthood with our tax dollars. You know, that's like being forced to pay your abuser over and over again. Abortion is not health care. It is the taking of an innocent life. Thank you. Unfortunately, the Israelites were not wise to the ways of this false god. Solomon built a place of worship to Moloch. The people sacrificed their children, as did kings Ahaz and Manasseh, provoking the Lord to anger. Then came Josiah, a king who loved the Lord with all his heart, soul, and might. He read in the law that anyone who sacrifices their children to Moloch shall face the wrath of God, and those who ignore child sacrifice would be cut off from God and his people. Josiah was grieved and repented before the Lord. He destroyed every high place to every false god. He defiled Tophet so that no one would ever again burn a son or daughter to Moloch. The Lord blessed him with peace. 
but Israel remained unrepentant and were handed over to their enemies. 